have uh, people ask if they have. Okay, well, I just want to take a minute and welcome you all. Oh, there's here's Gail or Gina is here. Um, my name is Britt Anderson. I'm the new president of the Minnesota Lyme Association. And I'd like to welcome you all. Today is the second week of the 2024 Free Fridays with Dr. Bercota. Uh, we will be meeting each Friday from 1.30 to 3 until March 1st. And we're honored and so thankful to have Dr. Bercota and other practitioners volunteer their time to present topics on health and healing. We will be recording these sessions and posting them on our website, which is mnlime.org. Um, I did find out this morning that we had a hiccup with our website the last couple of days and the webmaster did fix all the kinks this morning. So the website is back up and working and signing up on the bottom of the homepage to receive the e-class is now working as well. Um, we currently have support meetings the second Tuesday of each month at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, that information is on the Facebook page and also on the website. And Britt, I'll, it, I'll admit people while you're okay. talking. Thanks. Um, so today's speakers are Dr. Karen Bracota and Jane Rosen. And well, I'll let Karen, you can take over and introduce yourself if you want to. Great, great. Thanks, Britt. Yeah. And Britt, did you say that you're the president of the Minnesota Lyme Association? I did, yep. Okay, great. And we're always looking for uh, new members to come and seek information and support and support the Minnesota Lyme Association. Um, I've been treating Lyme disease in Minnesota since 2001. Um, attended my first ILADS meeting, International Lyme Associated meeting in 2003 and uh, had the um, gift of Lyme 19 different times. Wow. Babesia and Bartonella. And um, most recently talked about last week how uh, an exposure to mold woke up all of my um, uh, pathology at once. And, um, and I was diagnosed with autoimmune myocarditis. And, you know, from a holistic physician point of view, I knew that was a broken heart and I knew that I had to heal that and it wasn't a deficiency in antibiotics or mold binders. I had to do some mind body work. So one of the programs I was in called Bright Line Eating introduced me to the topic of internal family systems. And um, I felt like I was stuck in Groundhog Day because I'd find something that would get me feeling great and then... I would go off my plan and I'd eat something like sugar or flour, or I'd stay up too late watching a TV series and be sleep deficient. And then all my pathology would come back. And so um, I was referred to Jane Rosen who helped me find little parts of myself that were trying to help, but um, appeared to me to be sabotaging my best efforts. And through uh, working on that, little by little, um, I have reduced my self-sabotaging by yeah, 80, 90 percent. I'm not perfect yet, but it is a process. They call it parts work because it makes me break a sweat to do it. But um, <laughs> it's really helpful. A lot of people don't want to do it because they have deep childhood trauma going back to the very beginning and maybe generations of it. Um, but the work is the work of my soul. And um, it's how I got on track and how I got so now I can run up a mile long hill. Now I can bike for six hours a day when two and a half years ago, I couldn't walk down the hall without gasping for air. So Jane, how did you come to internal family systems? Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today, Karen, and I'm so happy to sh share what I've learned from practicing IFS, internal family systems. Um, back in the 90s, I was, well, starting in 
I started teaching uh, elementary school in 1966 and I taught and worked as administrator for 36 years. But in the 90s, I was working as a building principal in Chicago and one of my first grade teachers in the building was a, a certified parent coach through internal family systems. And I was able to observe how she worked with especially the uh, families who uh, of children who had special needs. And it, it was like magic. It was so helpful and supportive of the family and the and the child and, and everybody involved. Uh, I was really impressed. And then I didn't hear about it again until um, I joined Bright Line Eating, just like Karen did in 2015. Um, I had never had a problem with weight my whole life, but when I took an early retirement at the age of 55, I discovered my hidden homemaker and I started to cook a lot more than I had before and feed myself and everybody around me, including uh, treats that I don't eat anymore. But um, I gained about a pound a month and didn't really notice it until three years later, I was 30 pounds up. And uh, that's when I, I actually lost the weight through Weight Watchers and gained it right back. And then I lost it again and I gained it right back. And then I lost it again. And at that point, I said, there's something I don't know that I need to learn. And I learned from Brightline Eating how to manage um, my weight once I lost it. And I've been working with Brightline Eating ever since then. And uh, one of our Brightline Eating colleagues, Everett Considine, taught courses on internal family systems within the Brightline Eating Organization. And it was very helpful and supportive to me and lots of others who were um, working on either losing weight or managing their weight loss. So that's how I came to internal family systems. And then I was so impressed with it that I took my uh, professional training in 2020 level one, and then level two in 2021. And in 2022, I completed my certification as a practitioner. And I work now as a health coach. Wow, that's 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 fascinating to me because um, it's helpful in addictions. How do you see it being helpful in people with complex Lyme disease that have to like take good care of themselves and keep all their supplements and pills on time and get enough sleep and all of that? How can it be helpful to this group? What you're talking about are rules to follow, structures, guidelines, and we'll learn more about these parts later as I show you the model. Um, but we all have parts. Our parts Our parts comprise an inner family and they're doing their best. Many of them are frozen in time from the period when they were formed and they are as extreme as they need to be to protect you from whatever was happening to you at the time that they were formed. But through our IFS work, they can transform and if they are witnessed and we have ways of working with them that heals them. Most of our parts are young parts. And so we come to the realization at some point that that part of us that's running our business is seven years old. And that part that's trying to get along with my husband is three. So as you get to know them, you begin to help them to come into more helpful and supportive roles within your system. And so just it's as a we... process, Jane, it's usually um, several sessions that it takes to 
um, get to know these parts and to work in harmony with them? You know, it's so interesting. Just learning the model can help some people to say, oh, that's not me. That's a part of me. And I know that I can work with that part. And as I come to know it, I can dialogue with that part. And I can teach it what I want it to know. And that in itself is a huge healing. We call that unblending. Yeah, because that's at first we, we feel like all these parts true. of ourselves. Certainly has been true with me when um, Rebel didn't want to like uh, follow the rules. And then I said, but you really like to run because Rebel really likes to ride, bike and run. And so when I could see that this is the way to be fit and healthy, then I could get that part of me on board. Absolutely. So just knowing the model can be helpful. And then when you discover that there are parts of you that want to follow the rules, they really understand how beneficial it is for you. And there are other parts of you that want to indulge in other treats and experiences that aren't good for you. And so getting to know them can also help them relax and come into harmony in the system. And we'll talk more about protectors in a little while, but the protectors are, they're doing the best they can to protect the wounded parts of us. We are all born with parts and our parts are fun and playful and innocent and delightful and creative and trusting and open and sensitive. And then life happens and they get wounded in one way or another. And if IFS, in IFS, we have ways of go going into those wounded parts and helping them heal. Great. Um, so, so before we start Jane, the you wanna, model, you, Karen, I want you to do your slides now. And, and uh... I'd like to begin with the grounding meditation before we go into that. Is that okay with you? Sure, I love that. Okay, great. Um, is everybody okay with that? Okay, so just find a little more comfort in the chair where you're sitting. Maybe make yourself 5% more comfortable. And notice if there's something that you're holding on to that you can let go of right now. Close your eyes if that's comfortable for you, or you can keep your eyes open. Either way, it's fine. And if at any point you want to open your eyes, you can do that too. So take a deep breath in through your nose and slowly breathe out through your mouth. The exhaling breath is the part of our breath that brings the relaxation response throughout the body. So if you make that a little bit longer than your inhale, that will help you to relax. And as you do that, just notice what you're letting go of. And just bring one of your hands up above the crown of your head. And say, I am creative. You can say that silently or you can say it out loud. That means you have access to the whole universe of ideas out there. You can solve problems. You can do things new ways. You can change because you're creative. Now put your hand right here at the place of your brain and say, I am curious. I 
I'm not angry. I'm not judging. I'm just curious to know what's going on. And then right here between your two eyebrows at the point of the third eye, say, I am clear. I have clarity. Clear vision. Outside to things around me and inside to my inner family as well. And now at the place of your mouth and your chin and your throat, say, I am calm. So that everything that comes out of your mouth is calm. And your two hands over your heart center. Say, I, I am compassionate. I can feel my own feelings and I can empathize with the feelings of others. And then put your hands right above your belly button, just below your heart. And that's the seed of your courage. I love that word courage because it comes from the word cour in the French language that means heart. So the courage comes from our hearts. Courage doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It means that you feel the fear and you do it anyway. And then bring your hands just below the belly button to your gut. And that's where your confidence lives. You can take a stand can stand for yourself and your best interests. And then the last one you can feel through your seat on the chair or through your feet on the floor, and that one is connectedness. We are all connected with each other here in this Zoom call. And we're connected to Dr. Verkota. We're connected to ourselves and we can be connected to all of our parts and have loving and trusting relationships with all of our parts so that they can all join the team and work in our best interest. So just feel those positive characteristics up and down your spine. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Join us again here. Now I'm going to show you a diagram of the IFS internal family systems model. Internal family systems is not family therapy, although it was developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz, who started out as a family therapist, and he used a lot of what he learned in that work to develop internal family systems. IFS refers to the family of parts that we have inside of us. We may go through our whole lives without knowing who those parts are. But if we can enter into their worlds and get to know who they are and why they do what they do, we can develop productive relationships with all of them. Dr. Schwartz has a wonderful, relatively new book that's called No Bad Parts. 
And I love that. I mean, we can think now of all the terrible things that human beings do. But deep down inside, those parts, even the worst ones, have a good intention. And if we can learn what that is and show our appreciation for that intent, then we can relate to our parts and dialogue with them. So I'd like to invite you, if you can find around you somewhere a piece of paper and a pencil or pen, we're not collecting the homework. So this is only for your use. But find a piece of paper. It can be just a, a piece of printer paper or notebook paper or butcher paper, whatever you have around. And I'd like for you to draw a triangle with the point at the bottom, right in the middle of the paper. Not too big, not too small. And then I'll show you my model. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you now. Oh, you have to allow me to share my screen, Karen or Britt, whoever's doing that. I don't know how to do that. Let's see. Uh, maybe if you make me a co-host. It's Oops, done. You're, just your co -host. you're good. Uh, that is really I can do it now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's now. changing. Oh. Good. Okay. So all those words that I used in the meditation are parts of the self. And this is This is one of uh, their characteristics of the self. And you may or may not have noticed that they all begin with the letter C. This, the self is unique to IFS. And we talk about the self as something that we're born with. We don't have to learn it or develop it. We don't have to increase it or grow the capacities. The capacities are all there. But what happens is that our parts cover up those self characteristics. And as we begin to work with our parts and help them relax, then we're able to see more, more of the self. And the self is our healing power. We have two different kinds of parts. We have protectors, and we have wounded parts. When things happen to us that wound us, we have strong feelings that overwhelm us. And those parts sometimes get hidden away because they're not acceptable. It's not always acceptable to have strong feelings. So not only do they have the bad experiences and the strong feelings, but they also get exiled. So sometimes they can't even be seen or known about. But we can use the self to heal them. So what are those parts of yourself? And if you have a triangle drawn on your paper, write the word self with a capital S right in the middle. And as I present these words, just ask yourself, is that something that comes easily to me? Can you say, oh, I've got that. That's, that's really me. Or is it something that you would like to have, but it's not readily available to you. 
to. It's more aspirational. Or is it somewhere in the middle? So if it's something that comes easily to you, write the word in the, in the center of the triangle. And if it's not so easy for you, write it more on the edges of the triangle. Is that clear? Does anybody have a question about that? Okay, good. Creative. Can you think of new things? Can you express beautiful things in artistic ways? Do you have new ideas? Can you solve problems in new ways? You want to learn new things, learn about the people around you, learn about nature, learn about science, learn about your body. Do you have a clear view of your life and your life around you and the life inside of you? Does calm come easily to you? Are you compassionate? Do you have compassion for others? Do you have compassion for yourself? Are you courageous? Can you move forward even though the path is not clear? Are you confident? Are you connected? Connected to others, connected to yourself, connected to the natural world, connected to the planet. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a minute and I'd like for you to just un, um, unmute yourself and shout out any of the characteristics that came easily to you. What are your strong points? Compassionate. <laughs> Good. Good. Creative. Connected. Sorry. Connected, compassionate. What else? Learn. Curious. Curious. Wonderful. And that's what we need to do parts work. We need some of those CE characteristics. We don't have to have all eight of them, but even if you have one or two, you can get started with those. And very often, curious is the first one because I can really get curious about what's going on inside me. Why is that part doing what it's doing? And then if you can lean into some compassion, <clears throat> that really helps you to make progress with your parts work. Okay, let's go back to the model. Oh, I thought I would just go back to where I stopped. Okay. Oh, 
up from current slide. Good. Ay, 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 ay. Okay, here we are. And there are our eight C's. Okay, these wounded parts feel our pain. And that pain might come from shame. If any of these feelings or feeling states resonate with you, just write those down at the bottom, at the bottom point of the triangle. Worthlessness. Loneliness. Rage. And grief. There's nothing wrong with having these parts. Feelings are part of life. We're not trying to get rid of our parts. But we want to heal them so that they aren't in, in such extreme roles. We can help them to transform to something that makes the pain less. And when we acquire these wounds, and we can be wounded at any time of our lives, but most of these wounds happen to us when we're young. So when we discover these wounded parts, they, they are often young. They might even be infants or three years old or seven years old. And so according to the model, the protecting, protective system grows up around that to protect ourselves from feeling those painful, unpleasant feelings. And we have two different kinds of protectors. We have managers who are proactive. They're working in the front to create structures and rules. And all of those things that Dr. Karen was just talking about of those things that we know are good for us. We know perfectly well what we should be doing, right? There are things that are according to the rules and we know those rules. Very often when these managers come up, if you see images of them in your mind, they're carrying a, check, a checklist on a clipboard and they're keeping track of what you're doing and not doing. So those manager parts are being proactive. And here are some of our common manager parts. Now, these this is not an exclusive list. You could have hundreds of different kinds of wounded parts, hundreds of different kinds of managers, but these are just a few examples. A controller, you might have a, a food controller to tell you what you should eat or not eat. You might have a medical controller that's telling you what you should do and what you should not do for your best medical interest. You might have a judgy part that's commenting on everything that you do and say. It's telling you what's good and bad, what's beautiful and ugly. It's judging you. Self doesn't judge, but managers do. And sometimes if they're in extreme roles, 
they can be very harsh in their judgments. And we don't want to get rid of them, but we want to help them transform into something that's more like a coach or a cheerleader so that they can be helpful and supportive to us and not so harsh. We have caretaker parts that are very skillful at taking care of other people. Sometimes they're more skillful at taking care of other people than they are at taking care of ourselves. If you, you are doing for somebody else something that they can do for themselves, that's over caretaking. And if you can become aware of that, you can transform. You can become a reformed over caretaker. A striver. We all have things that we're striving for, whether it's prestige or fame or money or position or love. We're striving for something. And sometimes that comes from our own desires and sometimes it comes from other people's desires. We're striving for what somebody else wants for us. And then there's the inner critic. Um, I personally have a whole line of inner critics stretching all the way out to the horizon. They always have something to say about whatever I'm saying and doing. And the inner critic wants to be helpful, but it almost always gets what it doesn't want. As we work with our critics, we find out that they're trying to protect us from criticism. So what do they do? They criticize us. So right there, they're getting what they don't want. And then we have another kind of protector on the other side that is not proactive. They're not aware of the rules. They're not setting up structures. They're not following patterns. They're reacting after the fact. After we begin to, we begin to feel shame or worthlessness or loneliness, or rage or sadness after those wounded parts get triggy, triggered then the firefighters come in to save the day here's one example of a firefighter binge eating or even if it's not binge in eating it might be eating a small amount but of the wrong thing the thing that we know is not the best for us. Dissociation is a very effective firefighter. That means that you just check out mentally, you just leave the room, you dissociate, you're not in the room anymore. Drugs and alcohol are very powerful firefighters. They're there to soothe us. They're reacting to the pain that's triggered from the exiles. You might have a compulsion to do a behavior over and over, something that's not in your best interest. And you might be coping with an addiction. Personally, I have a powerful sugar addiction. It's the kind of sugar addiction that the first bite is the feast. And then I'm off to the races. So it's much better for me to totally avoid sugar 
and then I don't miss it. I don't need it. I don't want it. And my body's much happier without it. Um, same thing for other kinds of um, starchy vegetables or uh, flowers, other carbs that are not bringing us the nutrition we need. We can be addicted to almost anything. We can be addicted to gambling or shopping. Lots of different addictions. Is anybody resonating with any of this? Mm -hmm. Yep. Who said yep? Was that Sharon? Uh, I probably did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said did. it kind of loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was unmuted. <laughs> what did you recognize in all of that? Um, well, certainly the addiction, for sure, in that part. Yep. Great. Anybody else? Food. <laughs> right. Turning to food for comfort or soothing or distraction. Um, this is what we do. These are what our, this is what our firefighters do. They're trying to help us. I would always throw myself into work. Okay. So you can be addicted to work. Absolutely. Like I worked so hard, I never had a chance to feel my feelings. Right. So the work takes over your life, takes over your emotion. I recognize there were some wounded parts that I used to have that I've done a lot of work to try to heal somewhat from, but now where I am in life, I have some new ones. Okay. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. like, yes, Lisa. Right. Um, <laughs> I realize this is making sense that there's both, I have both a rule follower that is too judgmental about uh, at me, with me, and also a rule breaker, both sides that are both, that's why it gets confusing, you know, yeah. It gets confusing and um I but that's this is framing it in a way that makes that all understandable. Yes, just knowing the model is so healing in itself to recognize that these are patterns that we can recognize and work with. Lisa just mentioned what we refer to, and we'll talk a little more about this later. Polarized parts. For example, we might have a food controller who knows all the rules of the food plan, knows what we should be eating, knows what we have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's all laid out. It might even be written down. We know what it is. That's our food controller. The food controllers are very happy to have a food plan because they have a structure. They have a pathway forward. But then you might also have an indulger who's saying to you, oh, honey, you work so hard. You deserve a treat. Anybody ever hear that in their head? <laughs> uh, I used to have an indulger that um, we called the, the compulsive child. It was a little girl who was about four years old, and she would run into the room and get food into my mouth before I even knew I was eating. Has anybody had food in their mouth without knowing they're eating before? <laughs> yeah, that's the compulsive child. So when you have these polarized parts, you have a controller and an indulger, and the controller has to get stronger. And because the controller got stronger, 
the indulger has to get stronger. And then the controller gets even stronger. And the indulger gets even stronger. So you have this fight that just the problem never gets solved because those protectors are just fighting with each other. We'll talk about that in a little while. Anybody else? I uh, often hear things like just this once or just a little bit won't matter. And that's a firefighter. That's a, we call that in BLE, we call that a seductive rationalizer. It's a part of us that always has a good reason. And, you know, I'm going to start my diet on Monday morning, right? Is always, I'll start next week. Just a little bit won't hurt. I'll start next week. I'll get back on track tomorrow. And then sometimes tomorrow never comes. Anything else? I was just going to have anyone who's not speaking turn their um, uh, mute on. I was just going to say one thing I hear in my head lately is I think for so long I wasn't aware and more lately I'm more aware. But then I think like I think of that quote when you when you know better, you do better. And then I think like in my head, I hear, oh, my gosh, I know better. Why am I not doing better? So it's kind of that middle ground of like I'm not blissfully unaware anymore, but I'm still falling into the traps of stuff. Usually and a part of you does know better. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it almost makes it more frustrating because then I hear myself thinking, oh my gosh, you know better than this. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, certainly well, what I learned in Bright Line Eating, Jane, is succeeding on following healthy lifestyles is not about smart because uh, many, many smart people argue with their own limits that they put on themselves all the time. And um, it, it, it really comes down to this understanding of that these internal parts are arguing and judging and we just have to see them. So I think what you're doing is great. Okay, so let's go back to the other. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna close that one and I'll be able to find the other one. Here it is. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. And open up this other slideshow. Okay. So, um, Brent, you were talking about saying, oh, my God, I know better than that. Um, and so you're aware of that part that does know better. And so the first step in getting to know that part is unblending from it. And we have all kinds of techniques for unblending. One, one way that we unblend is to try to get a visual image of it. When that part comes up, that part that knows better, what does that part look like? Having said that, we know that 25% of people don't see anything when they try to get a visual image. They don't see anything, they just see black. In fact, Dr. Richard Schwartz, who developed parts work, internal family systems, he does not visualize his parts. So how does he perceive them? He might hear a voice or he might feel a feeling. He might have a persistent thought 
or the the part might come to him in a dream. He might recall some memory where the part was present, or it might be a felt sense. I just witnessed a session being done by Everett Considine uh, with a woman who was not able to visualize her parts. And she was really struggling to work with him because she he kept asking her to get an image and she couldn't get an image. She didn't have have any images. And after a while, she says, I don't see anything, but I feel something. I feel somebody hugging me. And she had that physical sensation of being hugged. And that was her perception of the part. That's how she was able to get in touch with it. It can be a physical sensation. It might be a pain. You can definitely work with physical pain as a part. That physical pain might have something important to tell you. How many of you visualize your part? No visualist, okay. Do you have a way of perceiving? Leaving the part, do you hear a voice, feel a feeling, physical sensation? And these are the reasons why, these are some of the reasons why we do parts work. Uh, we, I told you before that problems come when, when our parts get into extreme roles. Um, Michael Elkin, who's a wonderful IFS therapist in the Boston area, uh, talks about how in IFS, we don't use psychological, the kinds of conventional psychological diagnoses like paranoia or schizophrenia or depression or anxiety. We don't use those uh, conventional diagnoses terms, diagnostic terms. The only diagnosis that we give in IFS is that a part has gone into an extreme role. And by working with our parts, we can help to liberate our parts from those extreme roles and get them back on the team in a harmonious relationship with ourself and with the other parts. Uh, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that we might find that the part that's driving the car is three years old. And in parts work, what we strive to do is let the self with all of those eight C's move into the driver's seat. and invite the part, we don't wanna get rid of that three-year-old. And some of those parts might have important talents or skills, things that we need to help us manage our lives. But we want them to be in the back seat, not in the driver's seat. Um, Lisa, I think it was Lisa who was talking talking about how we have some parts that don't get along with each other. They just are constantly locked in a battle with other parts. So we have ways of helping them to not only get to know us as self, but get to know each other and appreciate each other and what the other parts in the system are doing and what 
and why and how that can be valuable. And then we want to extend our own personal self energy to the world. The more people who are growing their eight C's and who are experiencing self as a healing power and who are helping their parts to get along with us and each other, the more people who are doing that, the more we are healing the world. So just as you might wanna to get to know a new neighbor or somebody that you met in the park or somebody you met at church or at school, you would ask them questions about themselves. Let me get to know you. Tell me about you yourself, about your life. So these are some of the things that we can get to know about our parts. We might know what they look like, how old they are, they might have a gender, or they might not have a gender, or they might not even be like a, a human. They might be a block of wood or a cloud or a fence or a wall. Our parts can take any form. And then we find, about, find out about the emotion is the part sad, angry, fearful, disgusted, happy, excited? What is it feeling? If we listen, we might hear a voice, and sometime that, sometimes that voice um, Sometimes that voice sounds like a voice we've heard somewhere before. It might sound like one of our parents or one of our teachers. We might just feel a physical sensation and that's how we perceive a part. And in this important question, how do you feel toward this part? How do I feel toward that part? that's keeping all those rules, who has the clipboard in, in his hand and he's making checks on a checklist. How do I feel toward him? And if the answer is one of those eight C's, I feel curious or I feel compassionate, then we can move ahead working with the parts. But if it's anything else, that means we have a concerned part that may need to be hear from, heard from first. And then we want to find out about the part's job. We ask them, what's your job from your perspective? What are you trying to do to help my system? And when we learn what the part is trying to do to help, sometimes we can feel appreciation, not for what they're doing, but at least for their intention to help us. And if you can show appreciation and love and appreciation to your parts, then that can be the beginning of forming a loving and trusting relationship with our parts so that you can work together and dialogue together. These are some examples of polarized parts, parts that might be fighting with each other in our system. We already mentioned the indulger is fighting against the food controller. You might have a caretaker part that's dedicated to take care of children or take care of elderly people 
or take care of your spouse, take care of your home. And you might have another part that feels entitled. Well, that part is entitled to being taken care of also, right? So you have one part that wants to take care of others, another part that wants them to take care of you, and they can be polarized. You might have a taskmaster who has a whole list of things to do, chores to do, things that need to get done. And then a rebel that comes in and says, no way, I'm not doing all that. Or if not a rebel, you might have a procrastinator who says, I'll do that later. I'll start my food plan tomorrow morning. And I'm going to stop right there and see if anybody is resonating with any of this? Definitely the uh, taskmaster versus the uh, procrastinator. Yeah. I, I agree a hundred percent. Okay, I don't, I don't see your name. Um, the I'm the dog, it's Tiffany. <laughs> okay, I don't see the dog. <laughs> Tiffany, are you here with us? Are you, yes, is I am. Camera on? Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's see. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. yeah, There's it's working. It's working. <laughs> oh, hi, Tiffany. Okay, hi. so what what were you saying about polarized parts? Definitely the taskmaster. You know, do a lot of work, on, and then the procrastinator. I mean, that is just. <laughs> feels like me in a nutshell most of the time. Mm -hmm. I I agree a hundred percent too. That's <clears throat> and that procrastinator is a type of a caretaker. It's trying to take care of you by putting things off. So you can express if you can express your love and appreciation to that part for its intention to take care of you. It's amazing how our parts relax and soften a little bit so that when then when we want to dialogue with them, they're more agreeable to that. Uh, Julie, I hear your lips moving, but I can't <laughs> hear you. Okay. <laughs> I I like the idea of a manager with a plan, but then when it comes to implementation, I don't really have, I feel like I hardly have those skills. And I, I don't feel like it's procrastination, but maybe it's fear I can't do it or something, but there there's something there that I need to explore can explore. Okay. Ideas. Would you like to do some work with that part? Sure. Okay. So can you go back to a moment when that part was present, Julie? When you say you have a manager who is aware of the plan, who knows what the plan is. Sometimes I do, yeah, and I like that part. Okay. Okay, good. So then what happened? Can you go back to a time when that part was present, where you were aware of this manager who knew the plan? Yeah. And then what happened? Some things, in my, now that you bring it up, <laughs> some things in my life fell apart, and my life kind of fell apart for a while. And... I never quite got back to where I was in some ways. So I feel like I used to have a stronger implementator. 
So that, that's a pl good place so, to spend some time. So then you started to eat off plan? No, I'm not talking about eating. I'm just talking about kind of in, in general um, with various parts of my life. Okay. So I think I probably want to pause there because it was a, a big fall. And now I... I know where to kind of go back to and start to heal some of these parts. Good. Okay. So, and that's what happens in IFS. If you're not ready to take a look at a part, then you wait for the part until they're ready. Yeah. There's yeah. no no reason to rush, no reason to push. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you get to know that part, when that part comes up, you can say, oh, I know you. And then you can have a dialogue. You can have a conversation with them about all the different aspects of the situation. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for offering that. Does it help, Jane, if you're able to make a list of things to do, but not able to do it, that you talk it through with somebody or even journal about it? Journaling is a powerful tool to use. Um, it's good to, when you say you're not able to do it, what part stopped you? That's the important question to answer. What was the part that stopped you from doing what you knew was right? And then you can get to know that part. I think I think maybe for a lot of us, um, it was our physical state of being limited us from doing that part. We, we would like to make plans, would like to think about things in the future, but not knowing if we could physically handle it. In what way that you couldn't walk or you couldn't talk or all of those things? All of those, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I think um, brain fog, post-exertional malaise, a lot of the things from being chronically ill, I have a really good manager who knows what I need to do or what I hope to accomplish. And I think part of understanding myself more lately is being okay with not getting everything done and being easier on myself and not holding myself as strictly accountable to things if I just physically can't do it that day. I mean, some days my brain power is better than others. Some days my energy is better than others. And I think um, for a lot of us, it's a, you know, kind of a day to day, sometimes hour to hour, if you can get things done. And, and I think being a little bit gentler to yourself, if you can't do it, but yeah. Yes. Uh, how many how many people have a perfectionist critic? If they can't do it perfectly, they don't want to even bother, right? And so we can work with that perfectionist critic and help it to relax and soften. And Britt, I can't, I, I didn't catch exactly what you said about a post- something? Oh, I think a lot of us struggle with chronic fatigue and post-exertional malaise where, you know, we, we might want to get things done, but we either have to save our post-exertional malaise. Yeah. Like sometimes I want to get something done, but like I have plans tonight or I have plans tomorrow. So I kind of hold myself back today to hopefully attend something tomorrow. And it's kind of a juggling act. Um, yeah. So that and, and Jane, Jane, can I just inject here? 
something that happens to the Lyme brain. Um, uh, people with Lyme disease often report feeling like the rusted tin man. Oh God, they just can't make it go. They've never had trouble getting up and doing things before, but they are determined they're gonna do it and they are gonna get up and they're gonna go. And then they just like, nothing happens. And like, it can be a mental task and it can be a physical task. And so for me, like one thing I do for exercise is I say, I'm just going to put on my socks and then I'm just going to put on my shoes. I'm just going to step outside the door. And I trick myself little by little to get to the end of the driveway. And once the inertia is overcome, I can get a task done. But overcoming inertia is huge in people with Lyme disease. Yes, and that that post-exertional malaise that Britt mentioned, that could be a part. And you could visualize that part or hear its voice or feel its feelings or feel its physical pain. And you could work with it in the most gentle way. What I've been talking about all asking all these questions. It sounds like an interrogation. You don't have to work with the parts in that way. Sometimes the best thing is just to sit with the part. Can I just sit here with you? So Jane, so Jane, what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Gail was speaking. Oh, you have two devices on? I can't hear you. The two people side by side, and I think Gail has to turn off her sound so that Mick can speak. Okay. So I'm going to try and explain what I think um, is one of the missing pieces here as a caregiver of someone with Lyme disease. I watch Gail go through um, tremendous difficulty after she's done something physical, like try and work out, try and stretch, try and do things. And then her body shuts down. Right. And when her body shuts down, she struggles with still trying to do things. And what you're saying, Jane, is to pay attention to that part that's trying to manage doing more and more and more and asking it to just calm down and relax a little bit. I can be okay with where I'm at. Is that what you're saying, Jane? Absolutely. That is so well said. Thank you so much for saying that. And that's Mick that was just speaking, Jane. Oh, thank you, Mick. Oh, Tiffany, would you like to do some work with your procrastinator? Sure. <laughs> okay. So can you think of a time when the procrastinator was active, when you had a list of things to do and the procrastinator popped up and said, not now, not yeah, today. I mean, pretty much every day something comes up for the program. <laughs> like I haven't showered in three days because it's exhausting. So I today I was gonna shower before a doctor's appointment. And instead I went in with super greasy hair because when I, Tried to get out of bed this morning. I was just too tired, and the thought of showering um, before leaving the house just—I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> so something basic like that, or something very long. You know, there's there's less basic things that pop up too. But that's no, that's that's perfect. That's perfect. So as I said before, the procrastinator is a type of caretaker who's doing their best to take care of you. Hmm. Okay. 
So just let's see if we can find that part and get to know it a little bit. So just sit back in your chair and make yourself 5% more comfortable. Let your shoulders drop down. Take a few breaths in and out, in through your nose and out through your mouth. And then feel your body. You might even put your hands on your body somewhere and just notice this one and only body that you've ever had and that you ever will have. Oops, we lost her. There she is. And then feel your feet on the floor and feel the earth under your feet supporting you. And when this procrastinator part pops up, how do you perceive it, Tiffany? Do you have an image of that part? I, I do. It's kind of like a, <laughs> it looks like a swirly dark thing that is like kind of coming over me. <laughs> swirly dark thing, like a yeah. like cloud? Uh, almost like a cloud, almost like uh, the dust that follows pig pen around. <laughs> like a a dust devil. Yeah, exactly. And what's its feeling? What feeling do you get from it as it's coming? Like, like an energy sucker, right? Like I was just about to do something and I was just about to, and it's basically saying like taking any little bit of energy that I possibly had and just taking it away. Okay. So this part is taking away your energy? The procrastinator part is taking away your energy? Yeah, because I think if I try to do something and then I don't do it, it's because I feel like I don't have any energy. And so I feel like that's, what is the, that's what's driving the procrastination. Okay. So that exhaustion sounds like that underlying wounded part that's being protected. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So a part of you is saying, we need to take a shower. And this exhausted part is saying it's not, not going to happen. There's not enough energy in the system to make that happen. And then the dust devil comes in to make you stop. Does that yeah. sound right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. What is the emotion of the dust devil? I feel like it's mean. <laughs> you know? It's mean. Yeah. Um, is it angry? I don't know if it's angry. I just feel like okay. it has, you know, it ulterior motives is keeping me from trying to do what I need to do. Okay. So it feels mean too. Yeah. Yeah. Does it speak to you? Does it have a voice? 
what are the was, words that it says to you? Just like, no, you can't do that. Like, no, to say know. no. And where do you feel that dust devil in your body or around your body? Um, usually either in my stomach or around my heart. In your stomach or around your heart. And what is the sensation that you feel? Like, kind of like suffocation, like pressure. Oh, okay. Right. It's a very clear message. How do you feel toward that dust devil? I think at this point, I'm just annoyed. <laughs> I'm, you know, annoyed. I'm just tired of it. Okay, that's another part. <laughs> that, that's a concerned part, a part that feels annoyed with this dust devil. So can you turn to that annoyed part and ask it to step aside briefly while we get to know this part, this dust devil part? Yeah. Okay. Let it know that we'll talk to it or we'll listen to it at another time. Okay. Okay. It will have its turn. Right now, we're trying to get to know more about the dust devil. Ask that part, that procrastinator part, what is its job from its perspective? What is it trying to do to help your system? Seems like it's just um, trying to keep me from like overexerting myself. It's protecting you from overwhelm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? I feel like this is where I'm back to like the energy sucking. Like it, if it, it takes away any mm. little energy that I have so that I just don't get up and don't activate. Oh, very interesting. What is this part afraid would happen? if it didn't help you in this way? I think it, it, there's like a sense of, I'm already like functioning at a very low kind of energy level. And I think there's this idea that like, if I did get up and do certain things, but then I'd be so, burnt out that I like wouldn't function at all like keeping me from you know like failure to function <laughs> completely <laughs> I think is what it thinks it's doing keeping you alive in a way yeah yeah if it feels right can you send some love and appreciation to this part for its efforts to try to help you? Sure. And, 
And how is the dust devil part responding to that appreciation? Okay, it's listening. <laughs> it's listening. It, it's it hears, listening. Yeah. It heard what you said. Yeah. Good. Did it respond in any way? I feel like it has relaxed itself a little bit from being like on hyper vigilant. Okay. Relaxed a little bit. Ask the dust devil if it would be willing to let you go and meet that exhausted part. It seems like it, yes, with caveats. I'm not really sure. What, you so know, it has it's concerns. like a little bit hesitant. Yeah. Right. It has some concerns. So let's listen to what it has to say. What are its concerns? I guess just that I wouldn't be able to handle it. <laughs> As this part, how old does it think you are? Ask the dust devil. I'm getting a nine. <laughs> nine. Okay. Tiffany, are you nine? <laughs> not not in the trips around the sun, no. <laughs> okay. So the dust devil doesn't believe that a nine year old can handle it. But if it knows how old you really are and all of your life experiences that you've been through, it might feel differently. So can you show the dust devil a little movie of your life from the time you were nine? Just the highlights. Let it know who you are, who you have been, your education, your work, your family. And how is the dust devil responding to that information? Feels like it's getting smaller. It's getting smaller. So ask it one more time. We don't want to badger it, but we just want to see if the answer is the same or different. Ask the dust devil if we could have its permission to meet the exhausted part. Yeah, seems fine now. <laughs> now that it knows I'm not a nine-year-old, maybe. <laughs> okay. It believes you can handle it. Okay. Do you see that exhausted part in a particular place and time? Yeah, it looks like a, I don't know, it kind of looks like a fault in the earth, like the Grand Canyon, but more um, 
desiccated and less friendly than the Grand Canyon would look. So like a crack in the earth, that's mm -hmm. where the exhausted part is. Yeah. Can you go? Can you go there? You can sort of go there. It's there's kind of like a lava thing going on <laughs> on the bottom of the crack, so it's like I'm trying to go down to the bottom and it's on fire, I guess. <laughs> Do you need to retrieve that part and take it out of there? It sounds dangerous. Is that some, I mean, yeah. I probably do. I just scary. do it in your do it do it in your imagination, and bring it to a place, a beautiful place in nature. Some it could be any place, some place where both of you could feel safe and comfortable. Okay. Are you there? Mm -hmm. Where are you? At the beach. Oh, okay. Great. Are you holding the part? I'm sitting next to it. Sitting next to it. How old is it? Sort of getting conflicting messages <laughs> um, somewhere between 12 and 30. <laughs> okay, it could have different versions at different ages. It could be the same part at different ages. How about the 12 year old? What's it like for you to be there with that part? Okay. And what's it like for the part to have you there with it? I think it's happy. Content, I guess. Maybe not happy. Happy is a little. Content. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally content. Happy seems a little over the top. Lovely. Okay. And you want to move just as fast, fast or as slow as this part is willing to move. This might be all you want to do today. Or you could say to the part, I'm curious to know whatever you want to share with me about what made you feel so exhausted. It doesn't have to talk. It can show you in images or memories. Yeah, it, it knows. <laughs> what is it? I didn't hear you. Oh, I was just going to say, I, it, it knows why it's so exhausted. <laughs> Do, does it feel that you know? Yeah. But it, it feels that you really get it. Yeah. Okay. Has this part taken on some 
beliefs about itself or its life based on these experiences. And those beliefs are burdens. What are the beliefs? Having to walk on eggshells. Right. Anything else? That's about it. Okay. Ask this part if it would be willing to give up or release any part of that walking on eggshells. like getting sort of like a 50 50 <laughs> like conditionally I didn't I, I'm getting sort of a conditional answer yes but oh okay so maybe 10 percent of it I think, I mean, I think that a large portion of it, yes, it would be willing to give up. There's just like some residual stuff that seems like very there. Okay. So would it like to release the burden into the water, into the earth, bury it in the earth, send it to the light, the sun, release it into the wind or put it in a fire? Or you could get fire. it. Ah. <laughs> so go ahead and help this part. Release that burden or any part of it into the fire. How does that feel? Good. <laughs> right. So let's ask the dust devil to come back into this scene on the beach with us and let it see this exhausted part that has been willing to let go of some small part of its burden. What does the dust devil think? A little bit relieved. Okay. Does that feel like a good place to end right now, Tiffany? It does, yeah, thank you. Oh, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing your experience and your vulnerability with us. You. Would anybody in the group like to give Tiffany some compassionate feedback about her sharing? 
Well, thank you, Tiffany, for being so brave and bringing those broken parts forward. I know how scary it can be and how we don't want to name in a public area or private uh, uh, griefs, but you were able to speak about what's going on in a way that many of us get what's going on and really let go of stuff in a big way. And I, I, I just like touched my heart. Like really. I'm proud of you. Big time. That's hard stuff. I really appreciate your willingness to just to fully show up to this group of people that you don't know. I really honor you and I'm grateful for the insights that I got from, from watching you be, be willing to be that vulnerable. Thank you. And those of us who had the privilege to witnessing that work with Tiffany, we've received healing also, all of us have. Anybody else? And I hate to be a killjoy, but our time is up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're past uh, three o'clock. And um, so I just want to thank you, Jane, and everyone for showing up and doing, doing this work. And I hope you can see how powerful this is. Um, Jane, if people wanted to pursue more about this, what would they do next? Uh, well, I do have a website, uh, janerosen.coach, and you can learn a little more about me there, and then you can uh, send a message through the, the website to me. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And Britt, do you want to say You're anything so welcome. else for us to close? <laughs> No, I just want to thank you all and thank you, Jane. And yeah, it was a good session. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, Tiffany. Thank I think you that all. resonated yeah. with a lot of us that deal with exhaustion and fatigue. And yeah, so thanks. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, Jane. <gasps> this is my privilege. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right. We'll see you back.